I think we're at 31, 30, yeah, something like that. 31 right now. Yeah, and it's not even 7 o'clock. Not even 7. They want to hear more Rogue's more gallery. More <laughs> hey, Mike, I have a question for you. You were talking about Johnny Pesky. Huh? Did you ever see Jim Cott when he was out on the infield uh, doing that kind of work you talked about, the four games? I don't think I did, no. Man, he would get out there like at second base, and uh -huh. he'd have a coach just blister ground balls at him on artificial turf. Really? He won, I don't know how many gold gloves, a bunch of gold gloves, yeah. But he, he would, that oh, was yeah, his yeah, pregame yeah. Well, I think he's a, I think he's only second to uh, to Greg Maddox. I think Greg That Maddox sounds right. His that sounds right. Yeah, but I mean, you know, he really got out there and had the guy slam balls at him. Yeah. Here's, here's a story for you. So spring training, 91, 92, 93 with the Braves in West Palm Beach. Uh, one of the, the – get well, he was a guest instructor officially, but he was there every day. He was a regular coach. Was Nuxy was Phil Negro. Yeah. And I don't know if you guys remember, you, I, I think there are guys here that, that saw Nuxie pitch. He used to get rockets hit back at him up the middle. And so what he would do was down the left field line, behind the left field wall at the main stadium there in West Palm Beach, there was a half field. And that's where we would go and do our PFP every day. At the time, we actually shared it with the Expos. And he would pull us up onto the cut of the grass on the mound, and he goes, I don't want you to catch the ball. What? You don't want to catch the ball. No, don't catch the ball. Just knock it down. And he got pretty pro uh, proficient with that fungo, and he would hit rockets at our ankles. <laughs> all, all, he wanted to do, all he wanted to do was was just get us to knock it down. Well, a few guys go into the trainer's room with, with, uh, with contusions on their ankles and shins, and so then he had to start doing it with softballs. Yeah. But – you know, hey, that's how he played the sport. I mean, he got rockets at him, so he thought everybody should be ready for it. <laughs> okay, good stuff. Well, uh, Joe, how many do we have? 35. 35. Well, we'll have more join us. Um, yeah, welcome, everybody. Um, we have two new members since we met last time. Um, Jim Hirsch, who I think is on this uh, – some cast. I don't see him, but uh, I'm sure he's on there. And uh, higher. Now, one of the good things that Chris uh, Chestnut said today was we're up to 149 members. Wow. We had 134 last time we met. And what's interesting is 25 of those people are from outside of Texas. Wow. So I got to give Joe Thompson credit for what he's done with the Facebook and Twitter activity. He's gotten us to a lot of people that we haven't had before. And that's just excellent. And Joe, thank you again for, for all that you've done. We're just getting lines. started. Yeah. There you go. There you go. <laughs> and um, we're going to be talking in a little while about our newsletter that we're putting meeting before this meeting, talking about the good things that are going on with the newsletter. Tony Cavett will tell us about that. Really happy to have Mike Stanton with us today. Uh, Mike, as you all know, is the number two pitcher in the history of baseball as far as games played, and uh, that's pretty remarkable when you think about it. He has a 19 year career. I think it's, some of the books says 21, some say 19, but uh, <laughs> a, a long career. Uh, you know, he played for the uh, the Braves and the Red Sox and the Rangers, and he played for the Mets, the Giants, the Nationals, and and some team from New York called the Yankees. <laughs> where he won three World Series rings. And uh, he's got a wealth of knowledge. Uh, as you all know, he does the pre- and post-game uh, show for the Astros. He knows what he's talking about. And we're just thrilled to have him here with us today at our Sabre meeting. And maybe with luck, we'll get Mike to join Sabre. <laughs> Well, first off, I want to say hello to everyone. I know, you know Bob, Bill, you guys got me on here. I know it's been a long time coming. It's only taken a, a worldwide pandemic or emergency to get me on. But, hey, I'm here. I hope this finds everybody healthy. Uh, maybe not happy, but at least healthy. 
you know, I've been thinking about, you know, what, what I wanted to go. I know there's a lot of current events going on in baseball, and we can talk about that. But, you know, one of the things that, that's been a pretty hot topic lately has been the three-week spring training. So with the current events, especially with the information that came out today, you know, we're going to try and stay positive and not necessarily harp on what, you know, the, the ifs and buts of what went on. So the three-week spring training. Now, if you go back to 1995, I actually went through a three-week spring training. That was the strike slash lockout year and uh, an ugly time in baseball. And, you know, that three-week spring training, it was a little difficult. Um, you know, the, one of the things that happened back then was we really didn't know we were coming back. You know, that was, that was a situation that it was, we had no discussions. And then all of a sudden we had the, the injunction by the court, all of a sudden you're in spring training in a week. And, and, you know, back then we really hadn't, we really were not in the, the physical fitness craze that this generation was in. And I remember trying to get ready for spring training at that time. And it was, it was hard because you would get information. Oh, the talks are going pretty good. Okay, good. Let's go work out. Let's get ready. Uh, we're not going to talk for again for two weeks. <laughs> and just that, that emotional roller coaster that we were on, it was really difficult to get ready. And then all of a sudden you get to spring training, you had three weeks. It was a shortened season also. And, and we made it work. You know, the, the, why is spring training so long? You know, we, we know the reasons why. First, local economy, it, it helps local economy greatly. You see some of the spring training sites now, they're all spectacular, they're all multi-million dollar complexes, and that just shows that there's money in those locations. Baseball-wise, the reason is starting pitching. You know, position players and relievers don't need that much time. To tell you the truth, three weeks is just about the right amount of time to have to get ready for a regular season. But those starting pitchers are really the key. Um, three weeks really is a, is, is, a, is a good amount of time to get ready. And, you know, if there were a situation that I happened to be a big league pitching coach and I knew that we were getting pretty close, like we are now, uh, probably even maybe a month ago, of course, you know, the pitching coach is Brent Strom. He's, with, he's on the phone with these guys all the time. They all have their own throwing programs. Uh, but there's other things you have to figure out. You know, what, what kind of facilities do you have at your disposal? You know, are you in an area that's in a complete lockdown? I mean, are you having to go, uh, you know, just maybe just into your backyard? I can remember that late in my career when I was living up in New Jersey to get ready for spring training. I would go in my basement, and this is, this is, this is a true story. I'd go in my basement. And I would throw up against a cinder block wall. That's where I did most of my throwing. On occasion, I'd be able to go to a local facility and throw a bullpen. But most of my throwing was done just up against a, a cinder block wall in my basement. Drove my wife nuts listening to that ball bounce <laughs> off that wall, reverberating all the way through, through the house. Um, but one of the things that I, I, I felt like as soon as we heard that you know, we were getting close if I were a pitching coach, it's one of the things that, that, you know, I think about with all this downtime that we have is I would want my pitchers, when they get to spring training, I want them to be able to throw a minimum of 50%, I'm sorry, a 50 pitch, like 85 to 90% bullpen. So you were having to do some throwing at home if you had the facilities in which to do it. Growing up in the Braves organization, Leo Mazzoni, one of the things that we did, and I, this was the only team I ever did this with, from day one of spring training, we were facing hitters. Now, you remember, Atlanta's in the National League. So pitchers and catchers, you go, where are the hitters? <laughs> we actually hit off each other, believe it or not. And there were a couple guys on those early Braves team you didn't want to face. John Smoltz was the first one because early 90s, that dude had no idea where the ball was going. And it was coming in hard. It was some heavy movement. Uh, you just did not want to get in there against John Smoltz. The guy you wanted to get in there was Charlie Liebrand. Charlie Liebrand on his best <laughs> day to about 80 miles an hour. Yeah. Straight as a string. Really didn't get your hands rolling all that much. Hitting off a young Mike Stanton probably wasn't very good either because I didn't really know where the ball was going. But, you know, if I can throw that 50, that 50 pitch bullpen now – I'm pretty far into spring training. You know, in a regular spring training that you have six or seven weeks for pitchers, 
uh, for spring training, you know, the first 10 days, I mean, you're just throwing bullpens, you know, then you get into your live BP sessions and then you go into the games. So the other thing I would want my pitchers to be able to do from day one is I want to start facing hitters. You know, it's not just throwing the bullpen, but it doesn't matter how long you play. When you get hitters in the box for the first time, even after playing for 20 years, it's weird. You know, it takes time to get used to, even if you've been throwing bullpens, it's different when there's a guy with a stick standing up there trying to hit the ball back at you. So, you know, I really don't think for pitchers it should be that big of, a, that, that big of an issue with the three-week spring training because they should be coming into spring training, especially since you already had spring training. And I would be very surprised unless pitchers really didn't have an avenue in which to pitch to keep throwing while they were at home, then most guys probably didn't stop throwing. So it shouldn't be a big transition to kind of get back into things. Now the next question is position players. Position players is a little bit, to tell you the truth, it's a little bit more difficult because, you know, can you take ground balls at home? You know, can you see live pitching? You know, we, we know we're in a day and age that, that pitching is kind of, other than the home run, pitching is kind of dominating baseball. A lot of that has to do with the mechanics of swings, how pitchers are attacking hitters, you know, with the high fastball now because they can't get on top of it. But those position players, it's a, it's a little harder for them because a lot of times they actually need to be outside. They need to be on a field. They need to take ground balls. They need to work on their glove drills. You know, they need to see live pitching. But again, three weeks, especially if you start right from the beginning with the hitters seeing those live pitches, I think that you're going to be, they're going to be okay also. So I really don't foresee this any, any real big issue with a three-week spring training. Of course, we have to get there, and that's a whole other story with the current events that's going on in baseball right now. Bob, you got anything? I, uh, I muted everybody so uh, okay. we could hear Mike talk. So uh, go ahead and unmute yourselves if you have questions. Go ahead. <laughs> hey, Mike. Uh, part of sabermetrics, of course, is all the numbers. Numbers, numbers, numbers. Uh, looking at your totals, I want you to, uh, to guess what the numbers, which war is. You, your, your two best war seasons were back-to-back. -back. I want you to tell me what they were. Oh, gosh. <laughs> the actual war number? Or yeah, the year? war number. Oh, gosh. You know, being a short reliever, though, that's a, those are tough. You're right. You're right. But it was significant. There were two straight years where you had exceptional. One of them has to be, it was back-to-back. -to -back. One of, It has to be 2001. I think that was probably my, my best season. That's when I actually became a American League All-Star for the first time. And, you know, that, that was, was one of them. Story. Uh, four, maybe? No, no they're back-to-back, 2001-2002. In fact, 2002, you had a better number than 2001. Really? Um, yeah, I would say – so you want the total of the two years together? Well, I'm just telling you, those were the two years by war with the best year of your career. Well, I get, yeah, well, uh, 2000, 2000, that was, yeah, that was a good season. I mean, that was. 2001 and 2002. Oh, 2001, 2000. Really, 2002 was in. 2002 was a better season. Wow, how about that? I did, I did not know that. Shows what I know, how much I look at my own numbers. Um, <laughs> hey, Mike, uh, have weird. you had any conversations with uh, Hall of Fame writers about why there aren't set-up men in the Hall of Fame? Um, I, I think, yes, I have. And, and I think for the most part, I mean, we've just recently started to get closers in there. You know, Trevor... You know, Trevor Hoffman, the first, you know, full-time closer to get in. Then, you know, possibly one of the best players to ever take the, uh, take the mound in, in Mariano becoming the first unanimous. You know, I think you'll eventually get guys in there, but it's just going to take – especially with the way the sport is orchestrated now that, you know, to go back to the, the, the spring training conversation, you know, guys don't have to build up big – big pitch counts anymore because of the reliance on the bullpen. I mean, you're already, you're already in a situation that bullpens have more pressure on them now than they ever have because 
every night they're looking to cover anywhere from nine to 12 outs. You got to have a lot of arms to do that on a daily basis. Scott, I mean, Mike, you are a player agent, right? Or your I team? Was a, I was a player, uh, rep. player rep. Yes, player sir. rep. Yeah. How difficult is that situation? Like for what's going on right now when you have players speaking out, uh, not in concert with the leadership? Yeah, it's a little bit easier for them now. Obviously, there's a lot of information going back and forth in very short period of time. But you know, back then we actually had to, believe it or not, pick up the telephone and call. Um, and it was difficult. I was actually the player rep for the Yankees in 2002, and that was the first time that we did not have a work stoppage. And, um, and we were also negotiating in season. So it was a little different than the situation now. But, you know, I was pretty involved at that time, also being the only, you know, with the Yankees, big time player, big name players. Um, you know, we were a very good team, won the World Series. So, I was basically doing almost two press conferences a day and getting up to that deadline in, in, in August, um, I actually didn't pitch for about 10 days. And I didn't know till afterwards that Joe Torrey was, was the manager at the time, that he wasn't pitching me because he thought I was distracted because of all the negotiations and all the conversations we were having. But yeah, I was holding court before the game and then after the game every single solitary day and you know Joe knows how knows how difficult that could be now I wasn't distracted I actually told him I said coach I could have pitched but um, he knew he knew how distracting that could be because you know back when he was a player he was you know he was part of the union and they were going through some pretty heavy stuff back in the 80s also Mike, uh, one question. The one game you started in your career, 1999, New York Yankees. Yes. Describe, All right. So, describe that game. Romero Mendoza was a swing man between the bullpen and the, the rotation in the bullpen. And there was a rumor that he wasn't going to be able to start the next day. But we didn't know until that day because he, he was sick. And he came in, he was sick. And so Mel Stoudemire comes up to me and he goes, do you want to start? And I go, okay. He goes, well, it's between you and Jason Grimsley. So he goes back into the office with Joe Torrey. They close the door. They might have even just flipped a coin. I don't know. Um, and I don't know if I won or lost, but I ended up getting the start. And the way Mel told the, the way Mel told me was, I was actually sitting, standing out in my locker, and I had great conversation I had great uh relationships with all the writers we just talked baseball most of the time and I was talking to George King who still works for one of the New York tabloids and he um and he actually looks at George and he goes George you can't talk to him because he's today's starting pitcher and that's how I found out so then he turns to me and he goes okay Mike how long do you want to warm up? when do you want to start warming up you know thinking you know regular starting pitchers it was a 105 game. They go out at 1230 and they stretch and they long toss and do all this. I said, what time's game time? He goes, 105. I said, I'll start at 1 o'clock. And he goes, wait, hold on. Yo, we got the national anthem. We got to walk across the field. Okay, 1258. <laughs> so, so I'm also going to change my routine. And the last thing I wanted to do was use up all my pitches in the bullpen. You know, I'm a short reliever, man. When I go out there, I throw 15 to 25 pitches you know, five or six days a week, I'm okay. But I go out, I go out, I actually pitch four innings, four shutout innings against the Seattle Mariners. Um, gosh, I think I threw like 78 pitches in those four innings. Then Jason Grimsley came in behind me. He threw another four innings. He actually gave up the only run, and then Mariano got the save in the ninth. The incredible thing about it was, and this is where I was very hard-headed in my career, I never wanted – you, know, you go back to high school, I had always told my parents, go, I'll never pitch. I don't want to pitch. I don't, I'm a position player. I want to play every day. And I think that was my same approach as a reliever. I came to the ballpark expecting and wanting to pitch every single day. So after 78 pitches, I took one day off. And the next day, the, the day after that, we started an interleague series against the Mets at Shea Stadium. And – I actually warmed up like three times that day. Now I couldn't scratch my head at the end of the day, but um, yeah, it was it was it was fun to do. Uh, 
there were some I think that record was beaten by by somebody but he ended up going into the rotation I, I'm the only one with one star Mike who was the best manager you had in understanding the toll on a relief pitcher oh gosh that's a difficult question because most of my managers were old school managers you know um I know even in those Yankee years, if you didn't get in the game, they really didn't consider you that you considered that you pitched. Uh, Leo Mazzoni and the Reds and, and, and Bobby Cox, they were pretty good about it. They kept up with at least how many times you had gotten up in the bullpen. But most of those, most of those uh, managers, they were old school guys. If you didn't get in the game, it didn't count. And uh, I know there was one game – it was an extra innings game. I was playing with Bobby, the Braves. We're playing St. Louis, and we go to extra innings. Now, I was the first guy that warmed up in, like, the fifth inning. And then the game went 13, 14 innings or something like that. And I was the last pitcher in the bullpen. And I think I warmed up seven different times that game. In St. Louis, it was a day game. On that AstroTurf, it was before they had gone over to grass, just got awful heat. And the funny thing, the last time I warmed up, I actually didn't warm up. I didn't throw a pitch. I'm standing in the bullpen. They know that uh, La Russa knew that we didn't have any pinch hitters. But they were going to send the other pitcher out to go another inning and keep still save me in the bullpen. So I was actually, believe it or not, after six – times up in the bullpen, I was a decoy in the 14th inning. And both teams had – this is the crazy thing. Both teams have the lineup card. No, but there's no names on there. <laughs> Everybody's winches are done. So I was a decoy. So I just kind of – I was a little upset. I just stood out there in the bullpen with my arms crossed. Mike, I have a question. Uh-huh. August 29th, 1992, the New York Yankees – or 2002, rather – the New York Yankees were playing the Toronto Blue Jays at Skydome. That was the evening before the strike was called. Okay. What was the mood in the clubhouse after the game? Were you guys playing or were you done for the season? Did you expect to be back the next night? No, I think we were pretty optimistic about it. And I think there was, a, there was like a 1 o'clock deadline, a 1 o'clock a.m. Eastern deadline on that. And, you know, the story is that, you know, we got in just before the deadline. No, we did. It actually went to about four o'clock in the morning. And the interesting thing about that was that Bud Selig and Donald Fear, they actually had to get kicked out of the room. The guys that made the guys that made that that deal, Mike Weiner, who, you know, ends up being the director for a short period of time before he passes away tragically with the with the the, the brain tumor. And believe it or not, Rob Manfred. They sat in. They sat on in a table in a closed room, opposite of each other, and they just hammered out that contract. That was the first time we hadn't had a work stoppage, and actually, it was the last work stoppage we ever had. But yeah, I, I, we were pretty we were pretty optimistic. The the negotiations have been going pretty good, uh, and, I, and we you know it was just one of those things that we knew that we couldn't couldn't do what we did in '94. Both sides, and that was the key. It's not it wasn't just the players. The owners knew that the fan bases were not going to take that again. No, I'm, I'm open. So, Mike, let, let, let me let me ask the obvious question: uh, toughest hitter you faced in either league, National League or American League? The guy that just 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 owned you. Okay, early in my career, believe it or not, and I think it was his rookie year. It was Jeff Conai, believe it or not. I'm lefty, he's righty. You know, Jeff, incredible athlete. You know, uh, uh, just, you know, a world-class racquetball player. That's actually how he met his wife. Um, and I was facing him at a time, I want to say it was 92 or 90. I know you know it had to be 93 because of expansion year. And I'm facing him, and at the time I was closing, and I was throwing two pitches, fastball, cutter, slider. No off-speed pitch, just here it is. I'm going to throw it as hard as I can. And that at the bat that I'm talking about, he, uh, I threw him a changeup, 
and he fouled it off. And I threw him a curveball, and he fouled it off. I think I got him out, or he got himself out. Uh, let's see, another one. Um, Bobby Abreu was probably the toughest out I ever had. Now, that's left on – you go, well, left on left. Bobby was just so good at not offering pitches, and I think he hit – he hit well over 400 off of me, walked him a bunch of times. Uh, and the thing what he would do was he would sit there. He would stand there in the, in the box, and I would throw him a fastball for a strike, and he wouldn't offer. He wouldn't step. He wouldn't do anything. I'd throw a fastball right down the middle. And so I'm sitting – now I'm out there going, okay, I'm ahead in the count, and he's got me guessing. You know, is he wanting another fastball? Is he sitting on a breaking ball? I'm ahead in the count. And I'm, 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 I'm in my own head trying to figure out what he wants. And he ended up, he ended up, um, he ended up owning me. That was one guy left on left that I don't think, I, I don't remember getting him out. I, apparently I did a couple times, but man, he was just tough. Cause dude would just stand there and you couldn't read him whatsoever. I, you mentioned um, a minute ago about 2002 that the owners knew that they couldn't afford to lose the fan base. Right. Is there just a lack of institutional memory now with the owners? I mean, the players, there's turn, turnover, obviously. But the ownership, uh, some of those guys were around in 2002. Do they just not remember, or is there a totally different mindset? I, I, I don't know. I think that I, I, there are definitely some guys that are still around. Now, those guys, I mean, you know, we're talking 2002. We're talking almost 20 years ago. Um, and then if you go back to 94, you know, the, the, the number dwindles even more. Uh, yeah, I think that, I, I think that there's just, I think there's in, in baseball, and I'm going to say baseball because I'm going to talk about both sides. I think there's an arrogance. I think there is something to be said that, that, you know, the fans have always come back. You know, baseball has always recovered. Uh, of course, it took, you know, ESPN just showed, the, the, the home run race in 98, I think that had a lot to do with bringing a good portion of, of at least the fair weather fan back. You know, I think the hardcore fans were already there, but, you know, to kind of get baseball back in the mainstream. But I think there's an arrogance that, you know what, the fans will come back and, you know, we, we, we just have to work this out. And I don't, I, I don't know if that's a case. I, I, I hope that I'm completely wrong, but I think if we continue down the road we're going down, I think there's a chance that what we have known as Major League Baseball may be completely different. Mike, where do you see 2021 A.J. Hinch, Jeff Lunau employment opportunity, if Ooh. any? That's a great question. I think A.J. is, AJ is going to work. In. I don't know if he's going to jump right back into the dugout. I think he may have opportunities, but I think he's, you know, he wants to make sure it's going to be the right job. Um, Jeff Luno, one of the you know, brightest guys in all of baseball. I mean, that's why he got the job. That's why Jim Crane gave him the job way back when. Um, I don't know if he ever gets the keys to the car again. I think that he, I think that he does – he's too intelligent, and what he's done has worked. But I, I, don't, I don't think he gets a GM job and gets to run an organization again. I think he's going to be one of the brain trusts back behind the scenes uh, because I, he did not come out of this looking very good. Mike, uh, I appreciate you taking the time to talk to us. Uh, who was the uh, old ball player that you really were thrilled to meet and get to talk to? Oh, that's easy. It's a right here in Houston, Nolan Ryan. Um, when I first, when I first see the first time I, I didn't meet Nolan first. I actually met his wife, Ruth first. Now I got drafted out of Alvin community college. Yes. Alvin, Texas, where they were from. And he was a supporter of our baseball program at Alvin community college. So there was actually a couple times Gary Bullion was the coach that we actually had to go to his house there in you know pick up baseballs pick up nets whatever but we actually went to his house he wasn't there Ruth was there and to uh, uh, to pick stuff up and then I also had a weightlifting class with Ruth 
that Ruth was actually in the class there at Allen Community College. That was back in, what, 19, I got drafted in 1980, the school year 86, 87. Um, but, you know, the, the first book that I ever read on my own, okay, and I know this sounds terrible, but the first was Nolan Ryan's first book, Throwing Heat. That was the first book that I picked up and said, I want to read this book. I read books in school, but that was the first one that I read because I wanted to. Eight stories. Thanks. Huh? Mike, what the uh, baseball person, whether it was another player or a coach or manager, had the biggest impact on your career, and what advice did they give you? Okay, so – the first professional guy that I ever had a real conversation with was actually the scout that signed me. And here's another connection to Nolan. It was Red Murph. Oh, wow. And, wow. and I think I was, I'm not exactly sure, but I think I was Red's last major league baseball player that, that, you know, he, he will say he drafted that was that he scouted. Uh, there were a couple of guys after him, after me that, you know, didn't, didn't quite work out. And, and Red was up there pretty good uh, when, when, when he scouted me. And, um, but as far as coaches in professional baseball, was my double-A pitching coach. His name was Bill Slack. And he was the first coach that ever dealt with anything from the shoulders up. You know, Leo was a good pitching coach with simplifying mechanics. Leo Mazzoni simplifying mechanics, doing stuff like that. But Bill was the first one that, that kind of helped me with, with, you know, my mental approach with, with, you know, how do I want to go about this? What, you know, as a, I had been a starter the year before, now I was a reliever closer, you know, how to approach that. Uh, but there's one story that, that I always tell, and we're going to go back to, to uh, a guy I mentioned a little while ago. I had an outing, in I think it was Jacksonville, Florida, and I think I even converted the save. And for a long time, I actually had the uh, had the Southern League record of 19 straight appearances with the save, and it was one of those. But I had struggled. I had I, I, I walked a guy, had given up a hit, maybe gave up a run or two. Was you know really ticked off after the game, and the coach comes up to me and he goes, "I want you," and I had let up. And that's a big no-no in, in, when you're on the mound, especially when you're a max effort guy. A lot of times when you pull back on the reins, that's when you really start pitching like a shotgun. It just goes all over the place. So uh, the, pitching, the, the coach at the time comes up to me and goes, okay, I'm going to tell you one thing. I want you to remember this. And I've remembered, obviously, I've remembered this to this day. And it's if you're going to go down, go down as hard as you can. And that – that just, I took that right into my core and obviously remembered that the whole time. The interesting thing was, that was Joe Necro, a knuckleballer, that told me to go as hard as I can. <laughs> Mike, have you ever read uh, Brent Murph's book, The Scout? You know what, I haven't, and I need to. I mean, it's been on the list for a long, long, long time, but, you know, life gets in the ways. I don't know if you just heard that, my dogs are, are, are chiming in and um, yeah, I, I have it. I, there's no reason I haven't, I need to, and maybe this will be the little nudge I need to go ahead and read it. But yeah, that's, that's definitely been on the list. I should have done it a long time ago. Hey Mike, mm -hmm. how, how few games can they play this year where you would think it's a legitimate championship? That's something that I've been debating for quite a while. And to me, the number, you know, originally, because it's dwindled. You know, at first it was, man, anything less than 100 games. I mean, this, that, we just, it's a, it's, it's a joke. Then it went down. Right now it's 70. Um, I think a, a 50, a 48, a 54 game season, I think is a complete joke, uh, especially when you talk about, where we are on the calendar, even if you do want to look at Major League Baseball's hard date at September 27th, we still have the ability to get 75, 80, maybe even more games in. And I know Major League Baseball has said, well, they don't want to go past that date because they're worried about COVID. My opinion, this is not about the virus. It's not. This is about 
network television not wanting to go into November. And it's about the owners wanting to play as few games as they possibly can because of playing the players. You know, that's why, okay, we're going to, we, September 27th is the hard date, but, you know, we want to add a couple teams to the playoffs, maybe add two series and, and all of a sudden. So now, you know, you're kind of talking out of both sides of your mouth there. You know, we don't want to play regular season games, but it's okay for you guys to risk the virus to play postseason games. Mike, I have a question. Mm -hmm. You would have been around 10 years old when the Astros brought up a pitcher from the minor leagues named Mike Stanton. Did that resonate with you? Do you remember him pitching for the Astros? And I do would not that have inspired you to go into his <laughs> livelihood. Yeah, I, I do not remember him. Um, yeah, I didn't even really, it wasn't until I got to the big leagues that I even realized there, there was a, a Mike Stanton that played. He was a right-handed reliever, played for Seattle, played for Houston. Um, you know, numbers were a little low. Got a few years in, uh, but the <laughs> – this is terrible. The way I found out there was another Mike Stanton was at Fulton County Stadium, you know, we used to get – you know, just like every player, you get a lot of fan mail. Well, the fan mail back then, you didn't have – you know, the, the clubhouse attendants didn't mess with it. They, you had a You had a – uh, a mail slot, and you went and you, you looked at your mail every day. Well, I see this mail, this, this, this letter, and, you know, there's no cards in it because you can kind of ruffle, you know, bend the, bend the envelope around to see if there's a card in it, if it's just a, an autograph seeker. And there wasn't, and I didn't recognize, and it was, it had a Seattle um, address. And, you know, this is very early in my career, and I had never been anywhere close to Seattle. Well, I open up this letter, and it's a handwritten letter from a woman that was about two pages and, you know, it started off. It's I'm so glad to see you back in the big leagues. And she goes on and on and on. And, and there was some intimate stuff in there that I'm like, Whoa, hold on. <laughs> I think I was, I was 22 or 23 years old or something like this. And, and uh, yeah, so that was the first time I had known that there was a, there was another Mike. Stanton. Now you got to love, Occasionally, I've gotten his cards, uh, his baseball cards to be autographed. And he had a couple, you know, he had a couple cards that he had, man, he had a nice afro underneath that hat. <laughs> what did that lady look like? <laughs> What's that? So what did that lady look like? A letter, not a picture. <laughs> but there may or may not have been mentioned um, of maybe a child. Oh, yes. Yeah. So it was, you know, this, it wasn't whatever relationship he had, it did not seem like it was kind of just a, a one time fling type thing. Max Cates gets the gold medal for question of the night. <laughs> <laughs> Mike, are you a collector? Do you, uh, do you collect your old uniforms or whatever? I do have uniforms. I'm not really a collector of, of, of a whole lot. I mean, there were some, you know, there were a few guys here and there I would get an autograph of or, or something like that. But, you know, even as a kid, uh, you know, growing up down here in Houston, I really didn't even watch that in the sports, you know, really whatever sport was, was in season, I would just go out. We, I'd be out in the yard playing, it, you know, whether it was basketball, football, uh, not much soccer, but, you know, I was always outside, you know, one of my fondest memories is being a child. And I told, I, I, I told this guy this one time and, and he looked at me a little funny, but then I had to explain, but it was taking naps to Ben Scully and Mel Allen on the, the game of the week, you know, it'd come in on Saturday. I would go to the pool during the day and uh, during the morning and then come back and, you know, have lunch and lay down on the couch and watch the game of the week. And, you know, they're doing the announcing. And, and that was just a, a great fond memory. And I remember the first time, cause I didn't hear Vin for a long time. And then all of a sudden I go, Oh man, yeah, that pulls back. That brings back big memories. Hey Mike, did, did you leave baseball on your own terms? When you were done, were you done? Uh, no, I, I didn't really. Um, so I was actually uh, under contract. This was 
2000, going spring training 2008. I was actually under contract with the Cincinnati Reds. And uh, I actually had, it was the second year of a two year deal. And then the, I had an option for a third year. And uh, Dusty Baker, they had brought Dusty Baker on to be the, the manager. And I had gotten all the way up to the end of spring training. And I didn't even know that I was on the trade blocks. But the, uh, the ownership and general manager of, um, who was Wayne, Wayne Krisky, I think, um, for the Reds had pretty much told Dusty he can do whatever he wants. And actually, it was an old teammate of mine that he ended up keeping. It was Kent Merker, another left-handed, you know, reliever. And they, right into spring training, they, they released me. And I took it off. I took it off. I had just lost my brother recently. Um, had no idea that this was even an option. I even asked, Dick Pohl was the, the, the pitching coach at the time. I said, you know, if I, you know, they had said they had tried to move me. And, you know, I had asked them, I said, well, if you're trying to move me, I had pitched like three times on a backfield that spring. So if you're trying to move me, why am I pitching on a backfield? That makes no sense at all. Um, so, yeah, that, I took that pretty tough. Then I had uh, actually in August of 2008, I got an invite to spring training with the Cubs in 2009. And by the time I got to spring training in 2009, I was in great shape because I started I started working out again as soon as I got that uh, as soon as I got that invite. And about the second week of March during games, I had a knee I had knee surgery in 2003 with the Mets, and it it never really reacted very well. I kind of battled it through the rest of my uh, the rest of my career, and it started acting up again fluid in it. We drained it a couple times. We cortisone shot it a couple times, just trying to get me through spring training. And, you know, I was, I was, you know, minor league contract with a big league invite. I was still the last person that, um, that they let go in that spring training. But yeah, so that was it. So I have no complaints, you know, I have no ill feelings against Dusty and the Reds or the Cubs or anything, but to answer your question, unfortunately, no, I did not get to go out on which is what most guys, that's, that's actually typical. I have a question about cheating. Okay. Uh, was there much going on when you were playing or any particular team or, or things that they didn't talk about that actually happened? <laughs> were there shady things going on every single solitary day? One of the things that I did, I did every single day. Um, from about 91, I use pine tar every day. Um, I had it on my hands every day I went into pitch, you know, I, it wasn't, I didn't have it on my body, but it was on the palms of my hands. I wasn't out there very long, but you know, I really, you know, especially in this day and age where a lot of hitters will even tell you, I don't really care if they use pine tar, you know, you can't be Michael Pineda and have a big glob of it on your neck and make it obvious. But, you know, they would rather you, the hitters would rather you know where the ball's going. And so I, I never, you know, was that officially against the rules? Yes. But I don't think, and I know this is a big thing that, that uh, the Astros had with Trevor Bauer on social media back and forth. Um, I never thought, and I still don't, I don't think Pine Charge is cheating. Okay. And the reason I don't is because, I can't, it doesn't help me do something extraordinary with the ball. It doesn't help me do something I can't naturally do with the ball. What it does do is it helps me get a grip and the pitch will be more consistent. Now, the opposite end of that from sticky is slick. Well, that's a different story. You know, when you load the ball, whether it's Vaseline or Sliver or whatever it might be, Major League, it's snot, um, you know, a little jalapeno juice in the nose. Uh, what that does is that actually drastically reduces the spin rate of the ball. And that's what actually allows a ball to sink. Okay. You know, you throw a ball that's got backspin or side spin on it that goes down. The spin rate is very low. So that's what allows the ball. So, you know, Dallas Keiko with his sinker, his sinker is much slower in the spin rate than his fastball, even if the velocity is the same. 
And I can remember Norm Charlton had an absolutely filthy spitter. Didn't know how he loaded it, but you knew when he would throw it. And Norm, you know, Houston guy came out of Rice, great guy. He was so far in the Yankees' heads back in the day that they would watch him like a hawk. There was no way we were ever going to get a hit on this dude, ever. Because as soon as he came out of the bullpen, these guys were so intent on trying to figure out how he loads the ball that they forget to hit it. And, you know, what he would do, he threw a fastball and a split. And he would throw the split, and it would be, you know, seven or eight miles an hour difference off of his fastball. Then he would also, he all of a sudden, he would throw this fastball that was, you know, just as hard as his regular fastball, 92, 94 miles an hour. And it would fall off the table like a, a curveball. And they would jump up on the bench screaming and yelling, check the ball, check the ball. And there was one time that uh, Dan Wilson had gotten the ball back as when uh, um, Norm was with the, the, the Seattle Mariners. He had gotten the ball back. So the umpire looks in the dugout. He goes, really? Yeah, check the ball. So <laughs> he calls for the ball, and Norm looks at the ball, and he throws it. And he throws it in the dirt right in front of home plate. And, oh, my gosh, I thought he was going to fall over laughing. And I thought that our whole bench was going to have a coronary because they went freaking nuts. And like I said, he was an intelligent guy. He knew exactly what he was doing. And all he was doing was messing with all those hitters over there. So they had no chance of hitting Norm Charles. I'm going to ask you a question uh, regarding – the rule changes that are coming to baseball regarding the three batter minimum. Are they essentially legislating you out of the game? Well, Your type of pitcher? Yeah, not necessarily me because I wasn't really a left-handed specialist. Um, you know, I was, you know, you go back to my career, I pitched just about an inning per outing. Um, and, and there was, there was a lot of talk about guys losing jobs. Well, I never, I never thought of it that way. I think the jobs would change, but you're still got the same number of jobs. So, you know, the guys like, um, you know, the, the, the sidearm left or even the sidearm right-hander, like, uh, what was it Bradford with, mm -hmm. uh, with Oakland, you know, if you can't figure out how to get a left-hander out, those guys would kind of be weeded out. Uh, it was going to be interesting. Hopefully we, we get to see it. It'll be interesting to see exactly how they go about it, how they, the managers, there's going to be some trial and error. There's no doubt. And the game is going to speed up on the managers when we get to that point that, uh, you know, they, they, they have to work it out. Uh, and you're going to, there's going to be some matchups that managers didn't really want because, you know, the pitcher you brought in didn't get that one hitter out to get that third out so you can get him out of the game. So it, 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 that was going to be a fascinating or will be a fascinating part. I'm st still trying to stay positive here. A fascinating part of what's going to happen in, in this season to see how those managers and pitching coaches, how they manipulate that. Well, those guys that have been situational one batter guys, right. they had better learn to get the guys from the other side of the plate out or they won't be around. Yeah, one of the guys I played, Randy Choate, was a, 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 a real side-arming left-hander, uh, which right-handers absolutely killed him. Yeah, those guys, those guys are you know, going to be short-lived. Um, but like I said, you'll just have to, you just have to figure out um, – you know, Joe Smith, sidearm right-hander, he actually can get left-handers out because of his command and his breaking ball. Uh, you don't want to face a whole lot of them, but at least you don't have to take him out every single solitary time a left-hander comes to bat. When did you start thinking about a broadcasting career? Was that during your uh, active career or after? Um, it was really afterwards. Uh, I didn't um, – you know, I, if you guys remember Derek Jeter's, uh, Derek Jeter's speech, you know, he talked about one of the problems he had was enjoying the moment. That was me. I mean, I had a good time every single day, but I was not one that really, really thought much about the future or really thought about what happened in the past. I was a guy that kind of just lived in the moment. And um, it really wasn't until I got down here to Houston that, that it, it – I had the opportunity. It was, it was something that sounded fun. Um, it, go, it goes all the way back to when, um, when Fox was still covering the Astros uh, before it went over to, what did it go over to, to CSN. 
and you know did a few games here and there was 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 uh I guess was okay they kept having me come back and and then you know do a few games here and there ultimately I would like to get into a booth and 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 be a color guy if the opportunity comes up but I have a lot of fun covering the Astros doing pre and post game working with Kevin and the guys uh, there at AT AT&T. So, you know, if the opportunity comes up, that's great. But, you know, it's something that I've really enjoyed. Keeps it, you know, I love baseball. I love obviously talking baseball and it keeps me involved. So yeah, I'm good with where we are right now. Hey, Mike, Uh, along those lines, is there any reason that you keep a baseball with you on the AT&T set other than show us grip, pitch grip? Well, it's, 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 it's funny you say that. Because, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, it, it is partly prop. Okay. Uh, it's partly paperweight. It's, it's partly pacifier. You know, as a player, I, I had a baseball in my hand all the time and I'm not, I still do. I, you know, I still coach a lot. I actually probably throw now 10 times more than I did when I was playing. Um, It's a conversation piece. And if I ever need to show something, you know, a grip on a breaking ball or something like that, it's right there uh, right there uh, at my disposal. And and like I said, it's, it's a pretty good conversation piece because whenever it's missing now, I hear it. Believe me. Uh, Show us where the pine tar was compared to the, Actually, I had it. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you my whole routine. So I would get down to the bullpen. I would take a brand new baseball, and inside our pitcher's bag down there that had all the balls, there was a pine tar rack. And I would put a good portion of pine tar just on my palm, and I would take that brand new ball and I would rub it all over the ball, just completely cover the ball and cover both hands, take some rosin, put some rosin on. And I'll tell you what, when the combination was right, I could actually hold the ball, open my hand, and the ball would stick. That's how <laughs> sticky it would be. Um, obviously, if it's that sticky, I can't throw with it. But that would be the ball that I would play with, that I would flip, you know, uh, around the fifth or sixth inning. But you did that without your glove on? That was without my glove, just two, two, ball, two, uh, two naked hands. Now – my hands would be covered, they would be dark. So I would actually start rubbing. When you rub it, the dark would ball up, the darkness would ball up and you could, you could uh, kind of just get it off your hands, but your hands would still be sticky. And then when, it, when the phone would ring, the call would be for me, it's time for me to get up. I would throw that baseball away, get another ball, and that would be the ball that I would actually throw it because that ball would still be too sticky. I'd never be able to get it out of my hands. But that's how – so if I was ever checked, you know, one of the rules of the umpire, they can't touch you. But if they ever check, you know, my hands would show a little dirt, but it wouldn't be, like, covered in pine tar. And so that would be the way – but I never – never once was I checked. Because I don't think people really care. You know, unless, like, like I said before, Michael Panay, unless it was blatantly obvious – and John Farrell, you know, he's, if you remember when that happened, he was like, I have no choice but to check. When it's that obvious on his neck, <laughs> you know, and the cameras are zooming in on it, uh, even, even being a dark man himself, you could clearly see, he goes, I had to check. And I don't think the Yankees were really upset about him checking either because they would have done the same thing on the other side. Hey, Mike, uh, could you – Bring up some of the more interesting uh, sign stealing activities when you were playing. <laughs> yes, I have. Uh, you know, we the actual signs themselves. You know, Charlie O'Brien. We had a set of signs in Atlanta, and this is this is the funny thing about all this that happened, and we with the, with the Astros prior to the pandemic, and and you know, stealing this. You know, the Astros stealing the signs and everything. You know it always made me laugh just a little bit because if you really thought that they were doing it, there are sets of signs out there that are, are unobtainable. You can't, I mean, we had a set in, um, in the early nineties when Charlie O'Brien came over to the, to the Atlanta Braves, by the way, best defensive catcher I ever threw to hands down, just incredible hands. 
But we, he had a series of signs that it took us a little while to get the grasp on. But this doesn't happen very often. The whole team was on the same set of signs. And it was an, it was an adding uh, sequence that you used. You gave four signs. You add a couple signs, depending on what you add. You know, um, you would add you'd, you'd, you'd add two. Let's, I'll just give you two signs. So two would be a curveball. If it added up to three would be a slider. Four, a changeup. Five would be a fastball away. Six would be fastball in. So if you give two sides, you go one, one, well, a fastball is coming out to a curve. You know, if I go two, three, okay, there's got to be a breaking ball coming. It would be a fastball away. And the thing was, if you ever thought they got the sequence, you just change the numbers that you're adding. Instead of the first and last, you add the second and the third. So it always, and that's just one. There's countless examples of those situations. Uh, but there was, there's one story, again, early 90s, Atlanta. We're a pretty good team at the time. We're playing the St. Louis, uh, no, I'm sorry, the San Diego Padres. And, you know, it was a, they were a, a young team. And for some reason, in, well, in Fulton County Stadium, the home bullpen was down the right field line all the way in the corner. Well, for some reason, the second baseman was giving the signs to the outfielders to the right fielder and to the center fielder. So if it was a fastball, he would just reach behind his back and he would give a one. And about the second inning, we noticed this. And at the time, um, the bullpen coach down there, he would, so we, we, we made a phone call down and said, hey, we got their signs, they're doing this. And so the bullpen coach would stand up at the end of the, of the bullpen wall, uh, the, 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 the bullpen bleachers there, and if he stood still, it was a fastball. If he moved, it was a breaking ball. The funny thing, and that was uh, the, the bullpen coach was Ned Yost. And the funny thing about it was, I think we got three hits that day. And that, that was the, 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 the laughable thing about everything that happened this offseason. Hardest thing to do in sports is to hit a baseball, whether you know it's coming or not. And uh, that was something that, you know, I was kind of on the fence kind of all winter because, you know, I had to – doing a lot of national radio on MLB Network Radio, you know, I kind of had to – I didn't want to tick off the Astros. I didn't want to be too pro Astros because then I'm going to hear it on Twitter. And so I had to kind of ride that fence while all that was going on. But I made that point a couple different times that, you know, it's just not that easy. Even when you know it was go, what was, what was coming – and, I mean, you guys know better than I do because you guys, you're, how you guys pay attention to the numbers. I mean, the Astros were a much better team on the road than they were at home that year. And tell you the truth, I think it's one of the reasons why the Astros came up with the scheme that they did was because I can remember us in the media, we were asking AJ almost every single day, hey, what's wrong with the offense at home? Why can you guys, why are you guys killing the ball? Why is Jose Altuve hitting 400 on the road, but he's hitting 280 at home? And nobody can answer the question. They had no idea. And I think there was some real pressure there. It's something that no one's really talked about because no one, you know, nationally, no one really wants to hear why you did it. Um, but I think there was some real pressure there to try and figure out what was going on at home. And then they got the, the scheme together and the rest is history. And Mike, in regards, in regards to that, with the cheating and when it was exposed, the players, Clayton Kershaw and, and all these other players that just just went nuclear on the Astros. I, I, I want to know you, as a, as a player's perspective, that was just for the media, right? Because well, like you talk about, and, and they, those players would know as well, even if they knew a fastball was coming, that still doesn't mean they're going to hit it safely. So I was really concerned. The piling on was, was kind of egregious. Yes. And I just want to know from a player's perspective, that was just for the media's benefit, right? Because they know, you know, you Darvish was tipping his pitches, period. Game seven. It's game seven of the World Series. The guy's out there. And, you know. By the way, game seven in Los Angeles. Correct. And immediately after the World Series, it was well reported in the media that Carlos Beltran said he was tipping his pitches. We, we, tipped, we found out. Yeah. So, please, I, I just want to know your attitude, your opinion on, on players 
who know this stuff. And like you know, you can know what's coming. It doesn't mean you're going to hit a double or a triple. Not at all. Go watch BP. I mean, I, I, I you know. <laughs> exactly. Watch BP. And, you know, these guys, you're, you're throwing, you know, 50 miles an hour right down the middle. And, you know, these guys, you know, they get their base hits, but nobody's hitting a 1,000. You know, no one hits every single ball hard. Uh, and, and there was definitely some piling on. And I thought it, it did get – it did get out of control. Uh, I know there were a lot of guys talking, you know, big talk about, oh, we're going to hit the Astros and this, that, and the other. Uh, I think Rob Manfred actually did a pretty good job prior to spring training when all this was coming about to actually say, you know what, hold on, guys. You know, if, if, if this is, if, if this is going to be just target practice against the Astros, the, the repercussions were going to be, very, you know, the, the suspensions were going to be high. This, the, 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 uh, the monetary, the, 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 I'm going to take some of your money, you know, the fines were going to be high. Um, so I think that that was, that was handled pretty good by, by Manfred. I also think that it's real easy to sit there and talk smack to a camera while your teammates are around, while the team you're talking about might be on the other side of the country. It's another thing to stand 60 feet away from a guy, hit him with a baseball while he's holding a big stick. Um, it is not easy to do. Uh, I only did it once or twice in my career. Um, and it, it's just, it, it's, you know, it's just really not part of the game. But I, I do believe that there was a whole lot of piling on that was unnecessary. It was stupid. I mean, especially – especially when you were start, you were still hearing from guys two weeks later after it all come out. I mean, that was just, that was just ridiculous. Um, and I've always said that I feel to this day, social media is the devil. I mean, there's, there's really nothing good that comes out of, of Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat, whatever it is. One of the things I've always said was that those Social media gives people voices that should not be talking. Hey, Mike. Uh -huh. uh, how about the baseball for 2020? Will it be a, the baseball we had last year? Is it going to make some changes in the ball itself? Um, you know, Bill and I talk quite a bit, and he knows that I'm a little bit of a conspiracy theorist. Um, I don't think it's a coincidence that Major League Baseball uh, actually bought the company that makes the balls, and all of a sudden the balls were flying out of the ballpark at a record pace. Um, uh, to me, that's just a little bit too much of a coincidence. Um, you know, it, it's, it's incredible that that wasn't approached more last year that Manfred always said, and it was a completely useless statement. The balls are within the parameters. Well, what are the parameters? I mean, what, what exactly does that mean? I mean, that was just complete and total lip service. I do not expect the balls to be flying like they were. I don't. Um, you know, it, it's, it's, a, it's, it's pretty incredible when you guys, when you break down the numbers at the number of home runs, slugging percentage, all that kind of stuff. But – Every single year, we're setting strikeout records. I mean, yeah. it's, it's really incredible to, to see kind of the contrast in, you know, slap hitters are gone. There, there's no such thing. There's no such thing as a singles hitter. Some of that has to do with ballpark, the ball, uh, approaches at the plate, all that kind of stuff. But, I mean, we know that home runs pays. But, my goodness gracious, last year was a, was a, was a little crazy. Thank you. All right, going back to the uh, – let's hit the science, science feeling once more. Number one, as I understand it, the, the code breaker program is still legal as long as it's not used during a game. And number two, I think that the league has some culpability because they put this monitor in the clubhouse and then said, oh, you, you were cutting down on how much time you have to decide. So put it closer to the dugout. And the players are sitting there, and they're going, oh, crap, we can see the signs. Yeah. To tell you the truth, I, I, I think that that's one of the reasons why the repercussions for the Astros wasn't higher than what it was. I mean, the reason Jeff and AJ got fired was because you go back to 2017, 
Rob Manfred actually said, those are the guys I'm, I'm going to go after. I'm not going to go after the players. I'm going to go after management. Uh, and that's why those guys lost their job. But I also think that's why I know that they don't get the story if they don't give the players immunity. And I 100% believe, believe that the players would not have said a word unless they got that immunity. Uh, but, you know, Major League Baseball was definitely to blame for some of this. You know, what percentage? That's debatable. But they absolutely were to blame because they gave – the ability for these teams, for these players, these organizations to have this technology, and then they didn't monitor it. Like they were just – all of a sudden, everybody was going to be Boy Scouts, and that's not – you know, that's not the real world. You know, we're, we don't we live black and white. We live in shades of gray. When, when I explain it, I talk it's like letting your daughter go on an overnight trip with uh, her boyfriend and expecting them not to have sex. <laughs> that's uh, – for those of us that have daughters, that kind of makes you cringe a little bit, but you're exactly right. <laughs> questions? Come on, I know you have some more questions, guys. Hey, hey Mike, I have a, Mike, I have a question for you. Uh -huh. You just said that MLB expected all the players and all the teams to act like Boy Scouts. Uh, why did they keep making this mistake? over and over and over again, decade after decade. You could say the same thing about steroids or any other scandal that's come up. Why does baseball take this, take this approach that, well, we trust everyone? Yeah, it really doesn't make sense. I mean, especially when you talk about, talk about how, you know, all the owners in Major League Baseball, Rob Manfred, they've been around for so long. I mean, you know, you, you look at a guy like Jim Crane. I mean, you know, the guy is a billionaire. How did he get that way? He got that way from being a ruthless, very good businessman. And, you know, so he's dealt with people and all these owners, they've dealt with people their whole lives. But I, I don't really know the answer to that. I, I don't know. I mean, the whole steroid situation, uh, you know, the, the steroid era, the, the, the power era, whatever you want to call it in the late 90s. You know, the thing was, people, a lot of people don't understand. We had drug testing at the time. It was called for cause. But in order to bring somebody up on that, someone had to tell on you. And, you know, you look at, at what, you know, we talked about a while ago about ESPN airing the home run chase with McGuire and Sosa. And, you know, McGuire was a pretty big guy when he came up. Of course, nowhere near what he was. But you look at Sammy Sosa. They didn't know Sammy Sosa was going to have any power at all when he got called up. And, you know, I, I think there was people all over everywhere, inside the organizations, outside the organizations, kind of had an idea that something was going on, you know. But, you know, especially where we were in baseball history was still trying to recover – from two, from 94 and 95, I, no one was going to bring it up. So we had, that's, that's the crazy thing about it. Major League Baseball, as soon as they started bringing up, oh, well, we've been wanting drug testing for a long time. Hey, they had the ability to bring it up just like everybody else did, but they didn't do it. You know why? Because it would have cut into their bottom dollar. Mike, I'd like to ask you about the pressure of pitching in New York in 97, 98, 99 with the World Series appearances. You've got a player like Kenny Rogers, very accomplished pitcher, knew exactly what he was doing. He melted. Yes. Uh, guys in Boston, same thing. Uh, you know, Carl Crawford, hell of a player. Couldn't handle Boston. Tell me how you and, you know, your reliever – 70, 70 games a year, 70 innings. Tell me how you handle that kind of extra extraordinary pressure that comes with that kind of exposure and how guys succeed and how they don't. Well, first off, you have to know yourself. You can't take yourself too seriously. Um, and, you know, I did not listen to the media very much at all. You know, I didn't listen to WFAN on the way home. Uh, you know, that would have been the, the big one at the time. Time. You didn't have, you know, Sirius XM or anything like that. Um, you know, you just didn't, you just, you just didn't do it. Even, even if you were playing well, you know, you just didn't want to get in the habit of doing it. But, you know, the one thing I always felt, and one of the things that, that makes you good with the media as a player is to be accountable for what you do. 
And I always said, you know, no one was going to say anything or be harder on me than myself. Okay. And, you know, one of my approaches was always, if I gave it up and I knew, listen, I was an offensive lineman. I, 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 I was not a guy that was going to get talked to until I gave it up. And I would, you know, laughingly, I told you guys earlier that I had a great relationship with all the guys in New York. Uh, there's several of them I'm still friends with that uh, I told them, that, you know, in spring training, I hope I don't talk to you guys at all this season. <laughs> because the only time I talk to you guys is when I give it up. But if I did have a bad game, I wouldn't even take my uniform. I would stand in my locker. I would still have my hat on. And I would sit there and wait for them. And they knew that's who I was. And if you're accountable – and you help them do their jobs, and when things do hit the fan, they're going to give you the benefit of the doubt. And, you know, but I think that a lot of the guys that struggled in New York, that struggled in Boston, you can throw Philadelphia in there also, um, they kind of take themselves too seriously. They kind of listen to what everybody says. Uh, and that was definitely not me. Those of you that do know me, I, I like to have fun. I joke around. That's what I do. When it's time to get to work, we can get to work. But, you know, I'll make fun of myself as much as anybody else. And that just, that just, light, it just lightens the pressure on yourself. You know, Kenny, the crazy thing about Kenny Rogers is he played for both teams. You know, he, he struggled in New York uh, with the Yankees. But here show, shows you what the Mets think. They turned around and brought him into, the, into Shea Stadium. Like it was, oh, well, this is, this is the Mets. It's different than the Yankees. It's still New York. And Kenny was just a guy that, that he just carried a lot with him. I, I loved him as a teammate. Uh, he, was, he's, he was a friend of mine for a long time. He was a great guy. But, man, did he have a little bit of a dark side, and he could carry a grudge. Hey, uh, Mike, uh, we actually share the, uh, the same alma mater, so I just wanted to throw that out. But uh, I was talking to a parent, and, and uh, they're, you know, looking, you know, with the current changes in the draft and, and things with college. Do you have any uh, words of advice for them, uh, you know, to how to navigate uh, the changes and what's going on with baseball? You know, what, now, which, which school, Alvin or Southwestern? Oh, uh, Clear Lake High School. I thought you were, came from Clear Lake. Oh, no, that was my younger brother. Oh, okay. My younger, okay. Yeah, I, I actually graduated from Midland High out in West gotcha. Texas. But, yeah, we lived in Clear Lake, and my younger brother actually graduated from, uh, from Clear Lake High School. So there's still a connection there. I, I'll give it to you. Um, yeah, to tell you the truth, those are the guys that I feel the worst for, uh, the worst about with everything that we're going through right now. It's, you know, the amateur ball player, the, the senior that's trying to get to college, um, you know, the backlog that's going to be in college. How about the senior in college that, you know, was good enough to be drafted in the middle rounds? You know, can I go back to college? You know, there's a lot of information. There's a lot of stuff with the NCAA that we still don't know exactly what's going to go on. You know, in order to play, you know, they already said that they can have the year of eligibility back. But, you know, it, it also states that you have to be a full-time student. So does that mean, and I'm playing a spring sport, so does that mean I have to have another full year of tuition just to get that year back? Um, the backlog that's going to happen in the minor leagues, you know? Uh, it's, it's, it's unfortunate that, that all this is going about. And, you know, I know we just had the draft. Uh, I think it's a travesty that they only went five rounds. Um, you know, it, it, you know the, the thing that I would say, advice wise for for any amateur that's going through it right now is just keep working don't try and stress out about what's going to happen um because no one really knows and all that's going to do is ruin your day today um so just continue to get your work in i know baseball is opening back up now we're starting to see summer baseball again go out and have some fun remember why you started playing the sport which is because you love it you just love you know you love the competition you love to go out there with your friends uh, and let the future take care of itself. But, yeah, this is unfortunate. And, and, the, and the thing is, anybody that says they know what's going to happen is, is being naive. We have no idea exactly how this is going to happen, how long it's going to take to get the backlog of players. You know, is it going to be two years? Is it going to be three years? Is it going to be four years? How long is it going to take 
to, uh, to kind of get things back to normal when you talk about, you know, going through the issues we've gone through here with COVID-19. Mike, any ideas of how Major League Baseball can make itself more appealing to a younger fan base? Yeah, it was get on the field again about uh, two weeks ago. <laughs> that would be the, you know, I think the Major League Baseball, and, I, and when I, I'm talking about as a whole, I'm not talking about just the owner. I'm talking about the players and the owners. They swung and missed here. They missed the golden opportunity to – and because this is something – that's a question that Major League Baseball has been trying to answer for the last two decades. Easy the last decade is that the average age of the fan base is getting older. How can we appeal to new, younger uh, demographic? And – you know, I think with the bickering that's gone back and forth, I talk to a lot of people around town. They do not, you know, they're kind of getting, they've been turned off with what's been going on. And, you know, with the news today, I mean, it has not gotten any better. Um, but I think that they, they truly missed a golden opportunity here. I mean, we saw, you know, two older golfers and two quarterbacks set all kinds of ratings records playing golf. People were dying for live events. And, and I think baseball had the opportunity to get back. I knew, it, I know it was going to be tough and I don't want to belittle how difficult it is to get those, those, uh, those contracts and those issues resolved, but they swung and missed that this, this, they have, they, now that, you know, pretty much every athletic sports industry is going to be back. And I think that there's a better chance now than ever that Major League Baseball may not be. The executives talk about it, but how about the ballplayers themselves? Are they concerned about it? They are. They are. But, you know, I think one of the things, you know, I, I'm obviously a little, uh, a little biased towards the player side. I try not to be, but I am. Um, I've actually been pretty impressed with their resolve, with how they have stuck together. You know, I really didn't think that they had that kind of unity. Um, you know, I, I did think that they had shown, the, talking about the, the Players Association, they had shown their strength. I thought that they should have come back over the weekend with a proposal that came off that 100% of prorated salaries, come off that number just a little bit, just to show that they're, you know, you are, you know, being realistic in the situation. Um, you know, they decided to stay with uh, the 100% pro rata. And, um, you know, the commissioner came out today, said it's unfortunate, but, you know, who knows? Maybe we don't. You know, really what any negotiation is, especially when you get two hardliners like this, basically what's happened with the, the players coming out and saying, you know, just tell us when and where, is they're calling the bluff of Rob Manford, Major League Baseball, saying that, we don't think you will implement. Hey, Mike, how much of this is due to the agents, for the player, the bitterness of the team? Um, the agents play a huge part of it, but I, I don't mean that in a negative way. You know, um, I know that Trevor Bauer came out, you know, basically told Scott Boris to mind his own business. Well, guess what? It is Scott Boris's business. I think he's got like 71 major league players that he does contracts for. So it is, you know, it is his business. Most agents, you know, are realistic with their approach. I mean, obviously they're one-sided, but they also know that, you know, you have to get back on the feet. It doesn't matter, you know, which side of this, these issues you're on. The only way these things are going to get resolved and the only way, you know, the relationship gets better is if you get back on the field and start playing baseball again. Um, but the, the agents do play something, play a big role in it. Some play bigger than others. Um, I don't necessarily agree with Scott being out front with it, Scott being Scott Boris. You know, I do think they need to stay behind the scenes, but they've always been a big part of it. Because you got to remember, the Players Association, you know, they have a very limited number of negotiators, Okay. And um, I think the last guy, the, the, the guy's name is, his last name is Meyer. Um, he's only been doing this for a very short period of time. And he's never done a CBA where you have agents that 
have been around this for decades and decades and decades. So there is a source of information there. There is a source of knowledge there that the Players Association should utilize. Now, whether they do or don't, I'm not in the association now, so I, I can't really say to that. But, you know, I do know that those back in, in the past, agents did have a voice. Maybe it was just, a, you know, for information source, but they did have a voice. It, they were part of the negotiation. So this isn't something new. The agents have been there the whole time. Mike, I would uh, like your opinion and even Tao's opinion on this. What, what are the chances this actually goes to an arbitrator and an arbitrator decides on, you know, which side is the, um, gets their way. And, and we proceed to have baseball based on an arbitrator's decision. Um, okay, Tal, I'll, I'll go first if that's okay. I think there's a pretty good chance. And I think with what Rob Manfred came out saying today, backing off, you know, if you were just a few days ago, he said that, you know, 100% we're going to play a season. And that today he actually came out and said, unfortunately, I, you know, I'm not at that point anymore because I think that they see, they being Major League Baseball, sees a legal battle down the road going to an arbitrator. Um, and to tell you the truth, the players, the players side uh, has kind of dominated. The Major League Baseball side has not done well when, when in situations like this have gone to an arbitrator. Um, so I, I think that Rob Manford may be a little bit concerned about that. But the only way they would go to an arbitrator is if he did implement a, a season. You know, regardless of what the season is, since there's not an agreement with the player, he implements uh, that schedule with whatever pro rate, whatever prorated salary it was. Now all of a sudden, there's a grievance. There's a grievance on both sides, and and who knows how that. So I, I think that that's why Rob Manfred came out today saying that well maybe we won't have a season because if we don't have a season then I think it's much more difficult to have any kind of grievance that's filed. Tao, what do you think? Oh, you're muted. You're muted. You have to unmute. There he is. Talking. See him talking, but... Muted. Still muted, Tal. Stop right of your screen. All right, all right. we're live now. Yeah. 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 Now you're good. Okay. Uh, I thought thought Mike uh, gave a good explanation. Uh, at the at the moment, there's as Mike explained, there's a certain amount of posturing going on. Uh, obviously, it's a very uh, acrimonious negotiation, and I think that's unfortunate. But sometimes you find uh, lawyers and negotiators are, uh, uh, you know, <laughs> obviously have egos too, and they've got constituencies uh, that can sometimes uh, sometimes complicate it. But I, I think at the, I think at times they're more concerned with winning the fight than they are in finding an equitable solution, and I think this has really turned into a debacle. But to answer the immediate question, as 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 Mike explained, it's uh, likely uh, that the only way we'll see baseball is if the commissioner, if he implements a schedule, which he has the right to do, and uh, the the Players Association, Tony Clark, has said, fine, tell us where and when to report. Uh, but then what the union will most likely do and what Manfred is addressing today is the fact that the union will likely file a grievance. That grievance will go to an arbitrator. Now, at the same time, that's going to take some time. That doesn't mean that baseball has to wait to get on the field. But I think what the owners, what Manfred are trying to uh, overcome or resist is the likelihood of a grievance. And so for that reason, I think they're delaying now on the implementation in hopes that there could be some breakthrough 
uh, that will that will obviate that because uh, if, if it if it goes to a grievance, which wouldn't be decided for some time, the damages could be very substantial, and I think that's what the owners and Manford want to avoid. Uh, as, as it stands, it's not up to an arbitrator to determine whether they get back on the field. It's up to the arbitrator in the event the grievance is filed to determine if there was bad faith negotiation. Uh, it stands in this case by MLB, as alleged by the union, and whether the players, therefore, are entitled to additional damages. Cal, may I ask a question of you? I, since we started, I checked my phone, and uh, uh, Jeff Passan, I believe it is, has a report that now the players have come back with an 89-game suggestion, uh, but full prorated. Uh, and, uh, of course, the owners uh, will point out that that doesn't work for them because as long as there's no fans in the stands, their revenue source is strictly limited. What, what are your thoughts on that, number one? And number two, how much does an average club generate from ticket sales and concessions and things that they can control inside the ballpark with fans? Uh, well, the numbers I've seen recently, and obviously it's changed with the increased value of television rights and particularly the postseason which is divided among the 30, 30 clubs. But basically, something like 40% of a club's revenue is derived from the gate revenue and from the in-park concessions. So it, it's, a, it's a significant amount. Now, if, uh, what, uh, what, uh, if the players have offered uh, 89 games, obvious, and the, and the, uh, and the uh, and the owners uh, or, or, or the commissioner has in mind something like 50 or 55 games. That's a significant difference from the standpoint of prorated salaries. You're dealing with either 50% for a 50-game schedule or 89% for an 89-game schedule. And that, that's, that's a drastic difference. I, I, I think what the what hopefully the, uh, the compromise here might be someplace between those two numbers and the players agreeing to some kind of expanded format for postseason because the postseason television revenue to the clubs is going to be significant and substantial, particularly if it's an expanded format. Uh, the length of the season becomes an issue because of television. Television has other, other commitments and obligations uh, as, as come November, whether it's football or the national election or one thing and another, and I think baseball recognizes that, and uh, and in concert with their agreement with the television networks, they want to conclude regular season play uh, in September and devote October to the postseason format, which should be very interesting and very lucrative. Uh, if, the, if, the, if the players insist upon 89 games, I don't think you can get there. What is it impossible for these teams to negotiate the teams? I mean, players on one team and the union on the other, the owners on the other. Something to cover that major loss of revenue from no fans in the stands. For instance, a prorated schedule minus, let's say, 20%. Because if you say 40% of the average team's revenue is coming from home ticket sales, the two sides would share up to the point that if tickets can be sold at a certain point, then it goes back to the full prorated. I mean, this seems so logical, but I think it's probably something they've never even thought about. I suspect I've thought about it. I think there could be some sort of a, uh, some sort of a scale, as you suggest, uh, that, uh, you know, where, where it's, it's, uh, it's, it's a certain amount if there's no fans, and then if fans come back, uh, there's a graduated scale and so on. Obviously, Obviously, uh, that uh, you know that that involves a lot of give and take. And as I said, uh, the the problem is, I think uh, you you have egos at play here, and when you're in a fight, it's uh, hard to compromise. Uh, and I think I think the relationship has deteriorated so much uh, that it becomes difficult to make up that ground. We went through. A period of time there where the relationship was very good, particularly when Michael Weiner was directing the Players Association. Uh, you know, we, we, we had labor, labor peace. 
uh, as, as it stands in the current in the current situation, and and to a degree, I have to sympathize with Manfred because he's got a very difficult constituency. He's he's got thirty owners, uh, all of whom have uh, have been very successful, and many of them think that their solution is the best solution, or in some cases, the only solution. So it's hard for Manfred. He may not he, is, he and he and Dan Halem may not have the leeway that they need to make a deal. I don't know that that's the case, but I suspect that it's, it's a possibility. Uh, the union, on the other hand, I, 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 I think over the years, they have always been successful in being able to sell their game plan and their negotiating strategy to the players. The players obviously have a stake in it. Many of them are very interested, very well informed. Uh, but from the days of Marvin Miller and Dick Moss uh, on to, on to uh, Donald Fear and Gene Orza and certainly Michael Weiner, uh, one, not, one not, the players have always had a much more unified front and been able to carry out whatever their game plan is. The owners, on the other hand, it has not been that easy. Wow, terrific. Al and Mike, that was really a uh, in-depth um, conversation. Mike, we appreciate what you've done today. I mean, you spent an hour and a half with us. Hold on one second. Uh, yeah. Talking about those revenues uh, for the teams, uh, Tal's right. In general, it's about 40%, but every one of these 30 teams is completely different. You know, you get a team that's got a really bad regional sports contract, they're going to they're gonna have a lot bigger reliance on their game day gates. But you get a team like the Yankees that's got the Yes Network and everything like that, obviously their gate receipts are not going to be nearly as substantial, at least in their overall revenues. Uh, and so it, it's, it's kind of difficult to really put a number on those just simply because every team – Every, you know, every organization, they have their own individual situation in their hometowns. Yes. Do you think that another part of the bargaining is trying to get those numbers out in the open? Well, well and the other it definitely is. We don't have the socialism of the NFL in baseball. That's a point Mike's making. In the NFL, everybody is making exactly the same money off television because there is no such thing as local rights. They're all making the same. Uh, their ticket prices are pretty much the same and their stadiums only have to deal with 10 games. But the socialism basically that the NFL has, baseball does not, there's nothing shared uh, except for uh, the, the national, national TV stuff. And so it does, it makes everybody uh, have more money to spend. And that's something that makes the players, of course, probably not trusting. It probably is also what makes the owners themselves not trusting of each other necessarily. And I've always said, how valuable can the Yankees be if they don't have the Royals to play and beat up on? <laughs> okay. Mike, another comment? No, I'm good. Anybody got any other questions? Mike, I would like to end this on a nostalgic note. When you were on the Yankees, the glory years, 97, 98, 99, uh, did you have any interactions with DiMaggio, Whitey, Yogi? I mean, Reggie, the legends that come through there and were there all the time. I, you know, you're a relief pitcher. You're not Jeter. You're not R R R Mariano. But, you know, to, to have that, that, those kind of guys coming through there all the time, what, what are your experiences with that? Yeah, it, it was pretty cool. I was there the day that um, Yogi and George Steinbrenner kind of made up and um, – that particular day, Whitey Ford threw out the first pitch to Yogi Berra, and it, it was pretty remarkable, especially to see them walk off the field arm in arm, and they are both just these tiny little gray-haired old men. <laughs> to think back 50 years ago, I mean, this was the premier of the premier players of the sport. I mean, to watch Yogi Bear and to see the incredible numbers he put up and just to see how he was just a sweet little old man was, was awesome. And I was glad, really glad to see that 
that him and George were able to to put their differences aside, get him back into Yankee Stadium before uh, before the inevitable, and he passed away. But you know, spring training was awesome because you know the 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 stadium down there in Tampa has always been called Legends Field, or the new one's been called Legends Field, and the Yankees were really the first team to bring back their their big name players. And basically all they were there were to, to shake hands and kiss babies. And if the players had any information, you know, love Goose Gossage. You know, Goose Gossage was just an absolute total riot. I remember there was one time he's talking to one of the young players. And I had been around for a while and Goose and I had become friends. And he's talking to a young player on, on the mound. And they're, they're talking pitching and he comes over and sits down. I look at Goose. I said, hey, Goose. What were you talking to him about? You're talking to him about mechanics? Because you remember Goose's mechanics, he was just all over the place, just throwing the ball as hard as he could. But um, yeah, those those were those were pretty cool. And now a lot of teams do that same thing. They bring in their their uh, their legends into spring training just to have them around just for the nostalgia factor. Mike, you mentioned George Steinbrenner. Any favorite stories for, that you could share with us uh, about him? Some people liked him, some people didn't. But uh, any, any stories of your own? Well, as, as a player, I mean, there's nothing you would want more than George Steinbrenner. Why? Because he was ridiculous. He was stupid with his money. He didn't care about money. I mean, as an owner, what do you as – a, as a player, what do you want from an owner? If I need a middle-of-the-lineup hitter, he's going to go out and get it. It doesn't matter. I can remember when he brought in – Oh, it had to be 2001, 2000, 2001, something like that. He brought in Jose Canseco, and he being George. Uh, Joe Torre had nothing to do with it. Uh, and I think, I think um, if it was a trade, it was a small trade. It was right at the end of Jose's career. And the reason George, he just always – he loved brash players. He loved guys with attitudes and that had, you know, put up big numbers in big situations. And – you know, he loves superstar players. He's, he always said that, you know, New York needs its superstars. And, you know, Jose was about as super as you could get. And um, as soon as he came into the, the clubhouse, he walked into Joe Torre's office and Joe told him, he goes, look, I'm just going to be honest. I'll get you at bats when I can, but I can't promise you anything. I don't have any at bats for you. You're here because George Steinbrenner loves you. <laughs> Get it. <laughs> On that note, Steve. Mike, thank you so very much. It's been a delight and uh, very candid and very refreshing. And uh, I'm glad we got you to come to be with us. I don't know what the final number was, Joe, but it's uh, two full screens worth of uh, tonight and a couple of dogs, it sounds like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. They're letting. <laughs> you were well, awesome. Thank you. I appreciate you guys having me. Um, it was it was fun. It was great talking to you guys, and uh, I would love to do it again sometime. We'll take you up on it, my friend. Yeah, I think Bob, with with everybody going in and out, I think uh, we've probably had about 44, 45 people come uh, join the meeting today. Excellent, excellent. Almost getting close to fifty. Yep. Hey, Tony, can we, can you give us a quick recap on our newsletter? Yeah. Uh, this is a uh, where we are. I think we're, we're talking about a quarterly newsletter right now, modeled in a way after the Baltimore Chop newsletter, which would be about uh, four or five or six pages with photographs. Um, we have uh, a, a membership that is <clears throat> very willing and able, I think, to provide material to us. So we would like to do that. We're thinking now of the name of the newsletter being the, correct me if I'm wrong, <clears throat> the Houston Baseball Shooting Star Express. Yeah. <clears throat> that seems to cover all the bases, if I can use a higher term. So it will be a newsletter for the, the chapter here. We'll have all the uh, bells and whistles of a newsletter, including, you know, calendar, uh, table of contents, stories about the Astros, stories about Houston baseball history, uh, just uh, a wide range of things. 
and we would be depending upon largely our membership to provide material to us. And <clears throat> then we will refine that and make it suitable for public consumption. So, which will be nice. And uh, uh, that's generally what we want to do. And, and we'll um, develop plans as we go, go forward. We're, we're going to have people who have, we're kind of expert in developing templates and all the kind of technical things you need for a newsletter, which would be distributed, I believe, by email as opposed to you know, hardcover by, by mail. So that's generally what we want to talk about doing. And it should be a significant plus to our membership, I think. Thanks, Tony. I appreciate it. Um, we're going to follow up on this. It's a great idea, and uh, a number of people have volunteered already. Uh, Maxwell's already written an article for the uh, newsletter, and uh, Scott McKay's wife's going to do the, the template, and uh, we did, we've got uh, some good stuff, and uh, we're looking forward to it. We'll probably get together. We have a little group that's setting it up in about two weeks to follow up. Um, that's right. Before we have the trivia contest, uh, I do want to let, let you know that uh, we have a speaker for next month. Uh, it'll be on uh, July 20th. It'll be a, a gentleman who's written a book and spoke at, at Baltimore chapter, Sabre chapter. His name is D.B. Firstman. And he's going to be talking about Hall of Fame, Most Magnificent Monikers. It's a pretty humorous book, so I want to let you know that we have something lined up. And uh, thank you very much, Scott, for lining up the speaker. Um, okay, Mike, you want to uh, get into the trivia a little bit? Uh, I got it right here in front of me. This one's going to be easy. I give you all the answers. All you have to do is pick the right ones. In honor of Mike Stanton, who just left us, and he's been one of the best speakers I think we ever had. He just, anything you ask him, he, re, he replied to. So uh, I just had a really good time tonight. But Mike Stanton, here's question number one. And there are nine questions, but there are 43 total points you can get. Oh, boy. Mike Stanton is second in appearances with 1,178 pitching appearances in 19 seasons. The record is 1,252 appearances. So of the top five pitchers and appearances, name the other four all-time leaders. You get one point for each correct one you get, and you get another point for each one you get in the right order. So there's a total of eight points, and I'm going to give you, I think, I either have eight or nine people here. So pick from these, and four of them are the correct answer. Raleigh Fingers, John Franco, Jesse Orozco, Hoyt Wilhelm, Kent Tocolby, Lee Smith, Mariano Rivera, or Dennis Eckersley. So four of these are the other four in the top five. Okay. You get one point for each one you get right, and if you pick number one correctly, number three correctly, you get another point, four or five. Raleigh Fingers, John Franco, Jesse Orozco, Hoyt Wilhelm, Kent Tocovey, Lee Smith, Mariano Rivera, or Dennis Eckersley. Number two, we're on a relief pitcher, a pitching theme because of Mike Stanton was our guest. The most saves in a career is 652. Number five is 424. So the top five are between 652 and 424. Name the top five relievers in saves lifetime from these nine players I'm going to give you. Again, you get one for each player you get right, and one if, another point if you get him in the right position. So top five, there's a possible ten points. Billy Wagner, Jeff Reardon, Trevor Hoffman, 
Lee Smith, Dennis Eckersley, Raleigh Fingers, Mariano Rivera, John Franco, or Francisco Rodriguez. So, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. There are nine players there, the top five. Again, there are Billy Wagner, most saves career, Jeff Reardon, and Mike Stanton had 27. He was a middle guy. Uh, Trevor Hoffman, Lee Smith, Dennis Eckersley, Raleigh Fingers, Mariano Rivero, John Franco, or Francisco Rodriguez. Okay, now it gets a little trickier. We're going to most appearances. Mike Stanton had second in career appearances, but most appearances in the season picked the top five pitchers in, in appearances for a season. Solomon Torres, Pedro Feliciano, Mike Marshall, Kent DeColby, Wayne Granger, Paul Quantrill, or Wilbur Wood. Again, one point for the top, getting all five, and then another point for getting them in the right order, possible 10 points. Solomon Torres, Pedro Feliciano, Mike Marshall, Kent DeColby, Wayne Granger, Paul Quantrill, Wilbur Wood. We good? All right. Then most saves in a season. Answer 62. From these, uh, pick the top five from these. Bobby Thigpen, Eric Gagne, Mariano Rivera, Rod Beck, Dennis Eckersley, Francisco Rodriguez, Edwin Diaz, John Smoltz. You getting excited, Maxwell? Uh, <laughs> Bobby Thigpen, Eric Gagnink, Mariana Rivera, Rod Beck, Dennis Eckersley, Francisco Rodriguez, Edwin Diaz, or John Smoltz. Okay, so we've talked about relievers. Let's start about talk about starters. The other day, a friend of mine and I were, I, we were discussing Harvey Haddock's 12 perfect innings in 1959, which became very topical for tonight's discussion. I'll explain that in a minute. Haddix pitched 12 perfect innings before losing in the 13th. Lou Burdett pitched a complete game. So both pitchers went all the way with all the relievers. Now our quality start is five innings. On May 1st, 1920, Leon Cadero of the Dodgers and John O'Hara of the Braves pitched the longest dual complete game ever. All you have to do is say how many innings. It can be, it was more than 13, and I will tell you it was less than 300. <laughs> <laughs> but that's the longest where each pitcher pitched a complete game. All you got to do is pick a number, pick some innings. All right, this one's a little more specific. I'm not giving you the answer to this, but the Astro record for complete games in a season is 20. Who did it? Question number eight. Well, I skipped question number six, so this is question number seven. Apparently, I don't have a question number six. Two players have over 150 wins, and 150 saves. Each is in the Hall of Fame. Name them. 
One point each. And the last question, is it true or false? So you got a 50-50 chance. True or false? Giancarlo Stanton of the Yankees, father, is Mike Stanton. True or false? <laughs> gotta be. He's gotta be. <laughs> so this is the Mike Stanton quiz. I think Mike left us, but man, he did a good job tonight. Yes, he did. Proud of him. Does anyone need me repeat anything? That's the whole quiz. There's 43 possible answers, I believe. Okay. Or points. Are y'all ready for the answers? Yes. Yes. Okay. We put my glasses on. Okay. Number one in most appearances is uh, Jesse Orozco. Mike Stanton is number two. Number three is John Franco. Mariana Rivero is number four. And number five is Dennis Eckersley. Most saves in a season, 652. No, most saves in a career, I'm sorry. <laughs> Big season there, 652 <laughs> saves. Mariano Rivero, number one, was 652. Number two is Trevor Hoffman with 651. <laughs> Lee Smith is number three. Francisco Rodriguez is number four. John Franco is number five. Most appearance in, appearances in a season is 106. The top five are Mike Marshall, number one in 1974, 106 appearances. Number two is Kent Tocovi. Number three is Solomon Torres. Number four is Pedro Feliciano. And number five is Mike Marshall again. Wow. In uh, 73. Yeah, 92 appearances in 73 and uh, 106 in 74. Most saves in a season, 62. Number one is Francisco Rodriguez in 2008. And Edwin Diaz is second with 57, tied with Bobby Thigpen. Edwin Diaz had him in 2018 and tied with Bobby Thigpen. And fourth and fifth is a tie between Eric Godney and John Smoltz. Smoltz. In 1959, Harvey Haddix pitched 12 perfect innings before losing in the 13th. Lou Burdett pitched a complete game. On May 1st, 1920, Leon Cordero and Joe Osager of the Braves pitched the longest still complete game ever. How many innings was it? Who knows it? 26. 26, correct. It's the longest game ever played in Major League Baseball history. And just as a side note, reading up on this tonight, they had the 30th anniversary dinner for this in 1989, and Bob Buell of the Braves confessed that they were stealing the signs. Smokey Burgess was the catcher, for Pittsburgh, and he was like 5'8", weighed about 250 pounds, so he had to stand up in the high crotch to give the signals. Otherwise, the, his belly fell over his fingers, and they could read every sign he was given, so they would put a towel up 
over the bullpen for a fastball. It was a breaking pitch that take the towel down. And the only pit, only player that didn't want him was Hank Aaron. But they tipped every pitch for 12 innings, except to Hank Aaron, he pitched 12 perfect innings. So anyway, ask the record for complete games in the season is 20. Who holds the record? Durker. Who? Durker. Durker is correct. Two players have over 150 wins and 150 saves. Name them. Eckersley and Smoltz. Smoltz. Smoltz is one and Eckersley. Eckersley. That's correct. True or false? Gian Carlos Stanton of the Yankees' father is Mike Stanton. Hmm. <laughs> hmm? <laughs> True, false. False. Well, actually, it's true. But his father, Mike Stanton, works for the post office. <laughs> it was not our speaker. <laughs> so not you all get that one. That's a gimme. <laughs> Either way, not true or false, depending on how you took it. You're, you get not the Mariners, correct. Mike. What's that? Uh, not the Mariners. Yeah, it could be. It could be according to Stanton's story tonight. Uh, <laughs> Who knows? Anyway, that's a whole quiz. Very nice. So, who got one right? Yay. Who got five right? Or do y'all have time to total them yet? Oh, yeah. We totaled. All right, let's go to 10. I can't see the hand. Bob, you do it. Your show. Yeah. Yeah. I got to go back and forth between screens. That's the thing. All right, 10. Put your hands up again. Okay, Herb. Herb and uh, Mike. Okay. And me. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah, okay. Uh, what's the next one? Next, next number. That's uh, 12. Joe, me. Her. 14. Well, and, and, and Tao. Excuse me, there's Tao. I've got 23 points. Who's that? That's me. Uh, that was Scott. Scott, you got 23? Saving us some time the, uh, there, counting Scott. The, counting the bonus for the right order. Oh. Yeah, counting that, that counts. Yeah. Counting the bonus for the right order. Does anyone have more than 23? Tal, are you telling the truth? <laughs> That'd be a first. <laughs> okay. Uh, looks like Scott, you may be the hero tonight. Greg, you got your hand up. Does that mean? Uh... <laughs> Anybody beat 23? Greg, how many you got? I, I was scratching my head. I didn't participate. It was just a head scratch. Oh. <laughs> Well, then Scott Marzilla looks like you're the winner. Oh, I didn't see Scott. Oh, I didn't, Scott didn't put his hand oh, up. Oh, was it Scott Mc... Scott, Scott McKay. McKay. Yeah. yeah. Scott said, I think Scott Marzilla said he had 23. <laughs> yeah, I yeah had, that, was, that was me. Fewer than 23. It's Scott Marzilla. Right. Uh, okay. You didn't tie? You guys didn't tie? The two Scots? No. I was... <laughs> All right, was congrats. Teams. Congratulations, Miss Brazilla. You can write the next one for July. Will do. <laughs> That's good. Will do. <laughs> hey, great meeting, everybody. Great participation. Well, it was really good. And uh, we have our neighbor from Canada on here. And uh, let me. Hey, we we settled with forty-five people. Can I put a uh, plug in for something? If you can find it in a bookstore, old bookstore, buy it. It's a book that I had in my. I uh, library for a long time. It's Shoeless Joe uh, and Ragtime Baseball. The reason it's important is because it was almost exactly a hundred years ago that they had the trial for the Black Sox. This is the most extensive book. And by the way, it's uh, he mentioned uh, throwing heat. Harvey Fromer uh, wrote this book, and he was the writer with Nolan in in throwing heat. It's for ta from Taylor Press. It's uh, not new by any stretch of the imagination, but it's timely because it was a hundred years ago. Not only uh, did we have a, a situation that baseball was worried about its future because of the Black Sox scandal, 
but this goes through, you know, there were other, there was other cheating going on in baseball in those days, which of course was the most serious baseballs ever had because it involved throwing games, not trying to make yourself better by stealing signs or even PEDs. Anyway, I recommend it. If you can go to a half price bookstore, maybe you'll find it. I know everybody in here will enjoy it. It's even got Joe, uh, uh, the actual testimony before the grand jury word for word that uh, Joe Jackson uh, made before they had the trial and uh, that ended the career of the eight, the Black Sox eight. That's a good trivia question, Greg. What's the last year someone didn't cheat in baseball? I don't think it's happened yet. Uh, but 1749, it, Mike. It's been a long time since anybody threw games that we know of, and that was common back in the ragtime era. Craig, what's the story on the Kokomo jerseys? Uh, well, there is significance to them. Uh, I change my background every month. This was my American Legion jersey that I got to keep because they were changing models next year. And the other one was my father's. So this, oh. this one's probably from 1930-something. Uh, wow. They had not been eaten by uh, uh, animals. They had not been eaten by uh, – uh, this is that old heavy – uh, this is the same thing the Yankee uniforms were made of for years, that heavy-duty wool stuff. And uh, I don't know how they wore them, but they did. But no, I, I change them every, every month. You ought to get Zippo to sign one. I, I well, I don't. I actually, I have an old Dodger uniform from the Kokomo Dodgers, which was a hand-me-down from the Brooklyn Dodgers. Uh, but it wasn't. Uh, he played there before they were a, uh, when they were a Giant Farm Club, an open classification team. So I don't have that. I'm afraid. Maxwell, did your friends come on? Did my friends come on? I'm on. Yeah, I've I've got friends here, of course. <laughs> uh, could, I, could I put a plug in for something as well, please? Uh, July 11th, it's a Saturday morning. Dave Paulson out of Columbia, Maryland, is hosting something called Talking Baseball. He does it every month. That particular month, I will be his guest. I'm going to be talking about my book, Time for Expansion Baseball, the same book I spoke about in Houston a few years ago. I'm going to be doing a different topic. If you're interested in attending the Zoom session, I'm going to put my, my email in the group chat. Send me an email, and I will, and I will forward your information to Dave. Uh, I've attended a few of these in person. Uh, Ralph Peluso gave a presentation about a novel he wrote called 512. It was about what he thought would have happened if Babe Ruth had stayed a pitcher. And the title gives you some sort of indication. Ah. And the other one was a biography of Roy Seavers, which uh, Paul Simonelli had spoken about. So if anybody's interested, I put my email address on the scoreboard. If you could please send me an email and I will forward your information to Dave Paulson. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Take care and stay well. Good job, Bob and Joe. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Great Thanks, meeting. Bob. Thank you, guys. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Great trivia contest. <laughs> See you all next uh, month. Thank Great, you. man. Good work.